ஆ சாட்டாச்சுக்கா ஆ ஆ ஆ என்ன சொல்லுங்கா Uh, I can hear some background conversation hmm. going on. அத எங்க என்ன இருக்குது நான் ஸ்பீக்கர் இருக்கு வீவ் லிஸ்ட் வீடியோ தம்பல் சென்ட் இருக்குது தம்பல்ஸ் அப்புறமா வீவ் பார்ட்டிசிபன்ட் இன் ফুল ஸ்கிரீன் வீவ் வந்து வந்து ம் ஆ டாக்டர் ஆ சரி சரி செட்டிங் சார் இன்ட்டு இருக்கு அவ்வளோதான் இப்போ ஓகே ஒன்ஸ்ரவுதி he's um tachycardic with a heart rate of 180 per minute on 13 and his extremities are warm with bounding pulses he's quite distressed and with face mask oxygen his saturation is 90% so uh you've given him oxygen and uh, established an iv line given him two boluses of 20 ml of saline two boluses each of 40 Okay. and his heart rate has come down a little bit from 180 to 160 and his blood pressure is also a little better is 90 and 30 so at this point of time would you like to give him uh inotrope therapy and which agent will you choose the second case is um a four year old with suspected viral myocarditis um he's alert he's very tachycardic he's got a gallop he's tachycardic and wheezy his heart rate is 200 blood pressure is 85 on 50 extremities are cold so what are your options one or more may be right you can give a cautious trial of fluid because he's in shock um or maybe because you worried about primary edema you can give him some Next, you can start dopamine at 10 mic or dobutamine at 10 mic or maybe combine both or and the sixth option is to start him on a digitalizing regimen so based on these uh, two cases and the expected answer let's uh let's see our uh, the various agents that we can we have in our armamentary So looking at the cardiovascular physiology of various agents, 
So this is a famous diagram, which is there in all the PALS books, and you might be quite familiar with this. When you look at centrally the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood ejected with each beat of the heart, this is determined by how much preload is coming back to the heart, the venous return, the actual contractility, and the afterload within the heart. So stroke volume times heart rate will give you the cardiac output. And cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance will give you the blood pressure. What happens in hypovolemic shock or cardiogenic shock? What is the problem? So there's decreased free load in hypovolemic shock and decreased contractility in cardiogenic shock. So the resultant effect is a decreased stroke volume. The first compensation is an increase in the heart rate. If the increase in heart rate isn't sufficient to make up for the lower stroke volume, the cardiac output will fall. And the second compensation would be an increase in the systemic vascular resistance. This serves to maintain the blood pressure and because of all these compensations, the blood pressure falls late. But when you examine a, so when you examine the patient, you find a, a patient with blood pressure normal, but evidence of compensation in terms of increased heart rate, a child will be quite tachycardic, and the extremities will be cold with decreased urine output, which is a manifestation of increased systemic vascular resistance. So do you think these compensatory mechanisms, which may, for a short time, maintain blood pressure, it's not very useful for a heart that's failing. It's a, a heart that's unable to pump properly now, has to pump faster and faster, and has to pump against a lot, a much higher increased resistance. So it's going to make the job of the failing heart even worse, unless you, uh, the physician steps in and improves the, um, uh, and kind of and um, addresses the compensatory phenomena and addresses the root cause of decreased cardiac output. What happens in septic shock is quite different. Um, the preload may be decreased because of relative or absolute hypovolemia. The contractility of the heart may be normal, may be low, and some patients may also be hypercontractile. Um, and the stroke volume can go down initially. The heart tachycardia is much more pronounced. And rather than compensate for the lower heart uh, cardiac output with a high, high systemic vascular resistance, the, um, in septic shock, the systemic vascular resistance actually falls. So what happens to blood pressure here? The blood pressure will be far lower because the um, systemic vascular resistance has fallen when the cardiac output is already low. So you'd find a patient with tachycardia, with warm extremities, bounding pulses, and a usually a low blood pressure. Or sometimes the, the, if the heart is contractile, you'll find that systolic blood pressure is very low and the diastolic BP is I mean, systolic blood pressure is high and the diastolic BP is low. So let's look at quickly the receptors and terminology of the various vasoactive agents. You have quite a few at your disposal, and the most well-known and commonly used are dopamine and dobutamine. So a dopamine is, has been extensively used. Most people are aware that it has a dose-dependent hemodynamic effect but also a significant intra-patient variability. It acts at dopaminergic beta-1 and alpha-1 receptors. And it's because it's dose-dependent kind of effect at low dose, um, it's just got very mild uh, vasodilatation, but no role in preventing venous failure as previously thought. Moderate dose, it acts on beta-1 alpha receptors, but it's a predominant inotrope and very minimal pressure effects. At higher dose, more than 10 mics, is a predominant pressure with minimal anotropy. So um, in most patients, when 
most practitioners, when they don't know what's going on, would like to use dopamine at a dose of 5 to 10 because it has some anotropy, will prop up blood pressure because of its pressure effect. Right. Um, it is a good agent for shock with mild to moderate hypotension in the ICU because um, suppose you have such a patient with ARDS with hypotensive shock that persists after fluid resuscitation. Um, a little bit a patient who's on positive pressure ventilation, it may be quite a useful agent. It may be useful also for patients with fluid refractory septic shock, again, for its inotropy and pressure effects. However, if the blood pressure is normal and signs of compensated shock persist, dobutamine or milrinone may be preferred. And really, you need to know what is going on if the shock is not getting reversed. And target and tailor your agent appropriately. So dopamine, as we said, is very widely available, it's cheap. It can be diluted and given through a peripheral line for a short term. It does have some inotropy and pressure effects. So all in all, a useful agent for immediate short-term use. But what's the downside? Suppose the patient doesn't get better on seven mics or 10 mics. Can we keep going up to 10, 15, 20? Is it a problem? What do we know now? There's increasing reports that uh, dopamine may not be the best agent for the prime use that it was uh, initially uh, widely used, which is for septic shock, nor epinephrine may be a better agent. And in fact, um, a nice comparison, head-to-head -head comparison of dopamine versus norepinephrine. This is an all types of shock, showed more adverse effects in when dopamine was used, more tachycardia, more deaths. It does underlying cardiac dysfunction, mainly because it was tachyarrhythmia and immune suppression. So even there's, uh, there's even a a pediatric article which has come out very recently in the end of 2015 that shows more deaths and uh, hospital-acquired infections when dopamine was used. And the, in this article, dopamine was compared with adrenaline. Let's talk about the inodilators, and these are dobutamine, milrinone, and levosimendin. So starting with dobutamine, uh, <clears throat> compared to dobut uh, dopamine, it has got very very good anotropy. It does have chronotropy, but instead of causing increased um, SVR, dobutamine causes vasodilatation and a lowered SVR. So it is a very good agent in a patient with impaired cardiac function because it helps the cardiac output by not just inotropy, thereby increasing stroke volume, but also decreases afterload, all with minimal tachycardia, especially when the doses are less than 10 mics per kg per minute. So it can be safely used in cardiogenic shock, even if the hypotension is mild. How come, I mean, most people fear that if you use it with mild hypotension, the decreased afterload will cause a worse hypotension, worse fall in blood pressure. But um, because it increases stroke volume, in many cases, the mild fall in afterload is not such a big deal. But if the patient is volume depleted, if he's hypovolemic, then the increase in afterload can result in hypotension. So remember that in a patient with decreased cardiac function, the dobutamine improves stroke volume, improves stroke volume will improve the cardiac output, improved cardiac output can improve blood pressure. So the mild decrease in afterload will also improve the stroke volume and fall in blood pressure occurs mainly when the patient is hypovolumic or you go to higher doses. The side effects are when you use higher doses, uh, and maybe more frequent in a patient with underlying irritable myocardium, like uh, if, if there's underlying myocarditis, electrolyte abnormality, or at higher doses. And as I said before, hypotension can occur, especially if the patient is volume depleted. The 
the um, dose range of dobutamine is 5 to 20, but most people would limit the infusion to 10 mics per kg per minute. You can go to 15 mics per kg per minute if hemodynamics are stable. Uh, I mean, if uh, there's no hypotension or volume deficit, but generally you think of using another agent. You, you'd ask, you'd consider a supplemental fluid change to another agent if shock is not resolved with these, these doses. And the, the second commonly used, I know, dilator is a non catecholamine uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, which most of you will be familiar with. So, this is milrinone, which has anotropy and much more vasodilatory effects compared to dobutamine, also called an anodilator. So, it increases, milrinone improves contractility, decreases preload and afterload without increasing heart rate. So how does preload decrease with milrinone? Any of you can tell me? How does preload, we all know that contractility improves, afterload decreases, but how does preload decrease? So preload decreases because, because of the vasodilatation, the, the circulating blood volume is pooled in the extremities and there's less venous return to the heart. So this can also accentuate hypotension. So try and avoid too much of, uh, try and avoid the use of milrinone if the patient is too volume depleted because hypotension can occur. It's very useful in cardiogenic shock, especially with congestive symptoms because all the pulmonary edema and hepatomegaly just dries out and has synergistic effect with catecholamine and uh, can produce an improvement in cardiac output in catechol, I mean, refractory patients because it acts by a different mechanism. So compared to dobutamine, which causes a lot of increased tachycardia and increased oxygen uh, demand from the heart, the uh, supply demand ratios are much more beneficial in, a, in when milliners use compared to dobutamine or adrenaline. So indications of cardiogenic shock with normal blood pressure, pulmonary hypertension because of the fall in PBR, improved RV dysfunction. It is also excellent for a patient with diastolic dysfunction because it has lusitropy, so it relaxes a stiff myocardium. Side effects are precipitous hypotension and tachycardia. So while it doesn't directly cause tachycardia, it's not a chronotropic agent, it does cause a compensatory tachycardia and hypovolemic patient. When it's used at high doses for more than three to five days, the platelets may fall and toxicity is more frequent in renal failure. So it is advocated that um, 50 mics per kg is a loading dose is given, but in most instances, we are, um, most, the caregivers will be worried about ensuing hypotension, so you start with maintenance infusion rate straight away, which is 0.25 to 0.75 mics per kg per minute. And in renal failure, the infusion rate should not exceed more than 0.25 mics per kg per minute because some accumulation can occur. The third, um, I know dilator, so we talked about dobutamine, milrinone, and now we come to levosimendin. Um, Levosimendin, I think, came into the uh, treatment arena about just over 10 years ago. And the first couple of years, there were good reports, but we could only get it in India from if it was imported at a huge cost. One while used to cost, which will cost almost 50,000 half a lakh. That was 12 years back, and now it is even less than the cost of Melvinone, so it's widely available. It, it's got a dual mechanism of action. So it's always, when you have an agent which is a non-catecholamine, it is always useful to combine agents with different mechanisms of action. So it is a prime agent which causes calcium sensitization. Um, so just like melanone, it improves contractility of the heart without increasing myocardial oxygen consumption. So when you're looking at a supply-demand ratio, 
the um, demand uh, when milrinone or levosimendin are used are less. So keep uh, pace with the decreased supply when the heart is failing. It's got some potassium ATP channel opening, which for results in vasodilatation and improved blood flow to vital organs. So it is coming close to a fairly ideal agent because the cardiac output improves. In most cases, the heart rate doesn't increase. The blood pressure may fall a touch. Um, it doesn't cause much increase in oxygen demand. It doesn't have much of arrhythmogenic potential. The filling pressures decrease, which translate to decrease from, uh, um, decreased um, congestive symptoms. It can cause tachyphylaxis after a while, um, uh, which may decrease its efficacy when it's used on a long-term basis. But remember, this is a long. This is this agent has a very long half-life. So generally, if you use it once a week, it the effect may uh, persist for even longer. Uh, it, So in a patient, um, in some patients, we've used a cy uh, cyclical therapy with these three agents, taking advantage of levosimendin's long half-life. So a patient with, say, myocarditis, chronic heart failure awaiting transplant in low cardiac output would have infusions of dobutamine for two days, infusions of milrinone for another um, uh, so infusions of dobutamine for two and a half days, infusions of milrinone for two and a half days, and then over the weekend, a top off of levosimendin, and that keeps the patient going for a few weeks without causing tachyphylaxis with any one agent. So now we come to agents which are inopressors. So adrenaline. And vasopressin, vasopressin is a pure vasopressor, right? So adrenaline is widely available. It's very cheap. <clears throat> it's an excellent drug for hypotension due to cardiac component. It also has some vasoconstriction and improves blood pressure. However, <clears throat> there are concerns that it causes some, yeah, especially in the gut, kidneys, may have a problem very high doses, and it's got a short-term lactic acidosis, which is not nothing to do with a decreased platonic perfusion, but an independent action that, rever that reverses spontaneously after about 24 hours. Uh, with vasopressin, especially when there's severe vasodilatation, it is very useful in dopamine and nor NORAD refractory states. You need to carefully monitor the SVRI if possible, monitor limb perfusion, GI perfusion, because it can cause significant splanchnic and limb uh, ischemia, especially when the cardiac output decreases with this agent and there's a lot of vasoconstriction. Noradrenaline, it's a drug of choice in vasodilatory septic shock. Um, it causes much less tachycardia and splanchnic uh, ischemia compared to the other agents. So not much of splanchnic ischemia compared to vasopressin, for example. It is a very good agent when there's decreased renal blood flow in vasodilatory shock because it preserves vulnerable organ perfusion. It improves the filtration pressure to the kidneys and thereby improves renal blood flow and even a renal failure Secondary to vasodilatation may get reversed. You can, for a short time, infuse a dilute strength via peripheral line while attempts are made to get a central line. For a while, it was sent, uh, peripheral line, NORAD, was a big no no, but now there are increasing reports that you can use it via peripheral line for a short period. Good. So if you have a patient with a septic shock, and vasodilatation. Now there are increasing reports that the combination, so if you have 
septic shock, cardiac dysfunction, and very low SVR. This combination of norepi and glutamine seems to be an uh, uh, ideal agent, very predictable, more appropriate to those of septic shock therapy than norepi with dopamine or, uh, or dopamine alone. So noradrenaline or norepinephrine has three useful, I'm sorry for the typo there, has three very useful effects in vasodilatory septic shock because um, just like we saw that milrinone by excessive vasodilatation can decrease preload, noradrenaline uh, adrenaline by uh, squeezing the dilated vasculature can improve preload, therefore it can mimic fluid loading and decrease your fluid requirements. It improves diastolic blood pressure and MAP, therefore it improves coronary perfusion. It has very mild anotropy, so compared to vasopressin, it's a better agent, it has very mild anotropy. Of course, it's not comes nowhere close to dobutamine or adrenaline. Care during vasopressor therapy. In patients requiring vasopressor, as soon as possible, we must get a reliable arterial and central venous catheter because then you can give very safe administration. So central line access will permit safe administration without, um, without peripheral ischemia. And if the arterial line uh, insertion will tell you exactly what is the diastolic blood pressure, what is the mean, what is the pulse pressure, and you can titrate your vasopressor much more precisely. So when you have a patient on an anotrope and vasoactive agent, it's very important to titrate each agent to the desired hemodynamic endpoint. So they can be a very um, variable clinical response, and you might must have your goals very clear at the outset. As I said, uh, continuous intra-arterial monitoring is highly desirable, so you have better titration, minimizes side effects. If the patient is hypovolemic, whichever agent you use, the side effects may be greater. So this may be especially an issue sometimes in post-op patients. You have them on latex infusions. You have them on multiple anotrope and vasoactive infusions. So you should always make a judgment call whether the hypovolemia is significant, whether the tolerance of each agent will be good and monitor for side effects because they have a much greater risk of multi-organ failure. So we need to keep an eye on uh, extremities, renal function, coagulation, from, um, platelets, etc. Vasodilatation, uh, as you mentioned earlier, can cause much higher risk of hypotension of the patient at hypovolemia. Syringe infusion pumps are preferred. A rapid purge in an emergency will aid rapid uh, entry into circulation. And remember that brief discontinuation of an anotrope-dependent patient can lead to catastrophic hypotension. Infused through a dedicated uh, catheter, you need to clearly label all infusions. So all anotrope and, and vasopressors can be piggybacked into the same lumen. So they are all going at the same rate and you won't have, and ideally avoid, um, I mean, you're not going to give fluid purges through the anotrope or vasopressor line or a sedation purge. Use a lower dilution for peripheral roots. Dopamine, NORAD, Adrenaline and vasopressin should preferably be given only to a central line, whereas dobutamine, melanone, and your vaso and your uh, venodilators can safely be given to a peripheral line, even for extended periods of time. Sometimes we combine two or more agents, and this will be the uh, will be the uh, will be the will be a common scenario, especially in the pediatric ICU, if you have a patient with warm septic shock. That means the SVR is already low, diastolic BP is low, but you also have LV dysfunction. If you have cardiac dysfunction and decreased uh, ejection fraction, but a low diastolic BP. And you're worried whether if you use NORAD, whether the LV dysfunction will worsen. So tell me, whoever is listening on, which will be the agent that you use for a patient with warm septic shock and LV dysfunction? Anybody? 
warm septic shock and IV dysfunction. Can anybody tell me which agents you would use? Yes, NORAD and dobutamine. Uh, so, will NORAD um, worsen the IV dysfunction? Why can't we just use uh, dobutamine? BP will fall further. Okay, so um, why not a high dose adrenaline? So that is the other option if you use high dose adrenaline because it will cause, I will <clears throat> give you <clears throat> very good anotropy and at higher doses it will increase the SVR. But the main downside is excessive chronotropy. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you can, some people would use, say, adrenaline at 0.5 or higher doses, which will cause anotropy and increase SVR, but it causes a lot of tachycardia, and this itself will increase the supply-demand mismatch. So the other reason, apart from increasing SVR, what is an important reason that you need to have a good diastolic blood pressure. In <clears throat> to improve coronary perfusion. So coronary perfusion is determined by <clears throat> what is the upstream pressure or downstream pressure? Coronary perfusion. So coronary perfusion pressure, for example, in the uh, generally coronary uh, perfusion pressure is determined say in the Abdomen is determined by a mean blood pressure minus CVP, but for the coronaries, the um, perfusion pressure is determined by diastolic blood pressure minus CVP, right? Coronary perfusion depends on diastolic blood pressure minus CVP. Ideally, it is LA, but because you can't measure the, uh, the LA, it is diastolic um, blood pressure minus CVP. CVP is taken as a surrogate of the diastolic. So if you have low diastolic blood pressures, that can impair coronary perfusion. So on one hand, you're worried that giving a vasopressor such as noradrenaline can, de can worsen the upload. But remember, coronary perfusion is very, very important. So always maintain the diastolic blood pressure and use a concomitant agent such as dobutamine or even adrenaline at a lower dose with NORAD is a good choice. So we'll come to this aspect again with, at, um, in more detail. What about cardiogenic shock with hypotension? What are your agents? Cardiogenic shock with hypotension. So you need a, a, uh, any agent which causes a solid, um, uh, yeah, milrinone with epi. Um, any problem with milrinone? Milrinone can vasodilate a lot more and cause hypotension. So in the acute situation, maybe we could avoid milrinone. So we could start at um, I um, we could start with adrenaline alone, and then maybe slowly add uh, the vitamin. We could uh, add a touch of Nora just to maintain coronary perfusion. So your choices would be first, if the patient is hypotensive, significantly hypotensive, we start at adrenaline alone. We could add dobutamine once the blood pressure is slightly better. If you are using, you could combine dobutamine with NORAD, so any of these choices will be there. The problem with milrinone is that it's got a longer half-life. So dobutamine has a half-life of how many, how long, dobutamine? What is the half-life of dobutamine? It's a few minutes, two to three minutes. And milrinone's got a half-life of? of 30 to 60 minutes, about 60 minutes, one hour. So once hypotension ensues, you need to, the patient's going to be hypotensive for a long time. It's not, it's going to hang around for longer. 
So we wouldn't want to use mesinone acutely in a hypotensive patient. We want to maintain the blood pressure and slowly add um, uh, vasodilatory agents. So the butamine, I, I maybe I would use adrenaline in the first instance, and then maybe the other choice would be dobutamine with NORAD. But there are many ways to skin a cat, so there's no one answer which is right. But the general principle is that in a hypotensive patient, you wouldn't want to exacerbate the hypotension. You'd want to improve the cardiac output um, by an inotrope, inotrope, which does not cause too much of vasodilatation. So combining agents, pediatricians love dopamine and dobutamine, and I used to use it a lot myself, but it's very rare now to use this combination because it's, um, there are much more side effects. What I hate most about this combination is how fast the heart rate becomes. So there's a lot of tachycardia. Both agents, dopamine and dobutamine, cause tachycardia in a, in a situation where the patients are already tachycardic. So there's much more oxygen, uh, myocardial oxygen supply demand mismatch. The arrhythmia risk is higher, and um, the dopamine is it, it's somewhat considered like a general, um, like a the example. I, I usually give the example of a patient who's unwell with fever, goes to a general practitioner, and you use. The usual agents, say augmentin or whatever, for the say for a pneumonia, and the patient doesn't get better, is referred to a specialist. So I usually refer to dopamine as a general agent for a short term. It's a good agent, but if the patient doesn't get better, rather than go for a higher and higher dose of the same agent, you might want to find out what's going on and give the most, give the appropriate therapy. It's not a very good agent at higher doses. So it's a good short-term agent when you don't know what's going on. But if the patient doesn't get better, uh, find out what's going on. Is the SVR already low? Is the cardiac function not good? Does he need more of fluid? What is going on? And, and give the appropriate customized therapy rather than just hiking up the dose of dopamine to 15, 20, et cetera. So this is a short table of each agent. And uh, yeah. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, it's just a summary. But um, yeah, up here, the choice of vasoactive agent depending on the underlying pathophysiology. So, yeah, if you have cardiogenic shock, you first need to determine so in cardiogenic shock, you have myocardial dysfunction and the systemic vascular resistance may go up as a compensation. So you'd like to use an agent which has inotropy and a mild uh, SVR lowering agent. So what are your first line agents if the blood pressure is normal? Um, yeah. So dobutamine, second line agent will be made known once you uh, stabilize the patient and the patient is, um, <clears throat> so you're given some fluid, maybe start a dobutamine. Still not better, you could slowly sneak in some milrinone. If the blood pressure is low, don't bother with milrinone. First line would be adrenaline. Second line would be titrated dobutamine and norad. Right? So cardiogenic shock with normal blood pressure, start with dobutamine. You could give milrinone. Uh, low blood pressure, you need agents which will increase both the anotropy and the SVR. So <clears throat> this would be your agents. What is this anaphylactic shock? So you have nothing wrong with the heart, basically very low SCR. So the agents are adrenaline, adrenaline, and sometimes very low blood pressure not responding, adrenaline and norad. Warm septic shock with low SCR plus minus myocardial dysfunction. <clears throat> when the blood pressure is Normal versus blood pressure is low. So you give early fluids in all cases. Face uh, an arterial line early. Uh, NORAD for very low diastolic PP, add dobutamine if you think there's a cardiogenic element. If the blood pressure is low, start NORAD very early with aggressive fluids. 
and um, if the blood, uh, if your SVR doesn't pick up with NORAD, you could start some vasopressin because some patients with septic shock have vasopressin deficiency, and only when you add this agent, the blood pressure improves. So you have, can have warm septic shock and cold septic shock. Some patients may have myocardial dysfunction with an SVR increased. So these patients will be treated just like cardiogenic shock. <clears throat> so dobutamine and milrinone if the blood pressure doesn't get better. And uh, if the blood pressure is low, exactly the same. Add adrenaline and NORAD if the uh, diastolic BP is very low or the MAP remains low. Okay, so generally it's a lot of trial and error, and you'll get more information based on the actual cardiac uh, function, uh, looking at your echo findings, and some, in some areas you can measure the SVR and titrate accordingly. So step one in all patients with shock, regardless of the cause, would be to stabilize airway, breathing, obtain IV access, give fluid deficits if present. If you think of septic shock, give early antibiotics in the first present, I mean, first few minutes of recognition, and um, also uh, get your um, culture, get culture samples. If shock persists, determine if blood pressure is normal or low, right? So that is very, very important. Is the blood pressure, the mean blood pressure systolic, diastolic, is it normal or low? Is the, and then determine is your pulse pressure normal or white? So for this, for accurate information, arterial invasive arterial monitoring is helpful. Then try and figure out, even before an echo is done, suppose you're in the a patient presents in the emergency room, is the cardiogenic element present? How would you know that, whether cardiogenic? So the response to your early filling, whether there is a, a, la a large liver, um, crab, a lung, a wet lung. So combination of shock with respiratory signs is a cardiogenic element present. And finally, uh, you need to categorize the cause and type of shock. So this is the approach in the emergency room when you don't know the <clears throat> cause of shock. So let's look at this patient, come back to our two cases, 12 year old with community acquired pneumonia. So he's brought with increased respiratory distress. He's got big patches on his chest injury. The heart may be a little borderline increase, I have to say. He's got uh, lethargy. He's drowsy. He was tachycardic. His blood pressure is fairly low for his age. And he's got evidence of warm shock. Distressed. He's placed on face mask uh, oxygen. This is actually 40 ml per kg saline. The fluid infusion rates are much lower these days. Septic shock. So his heart rate and blood pressure is marginally better. So is anotrope therapy indicated? Which agent will you give for this patient? So anotrope, yeah, okay. Monodinaria. So that's why blood pressure is low, so we will be considering NORAD. And we'll need to see, so there is some hypovolemia element of septic shock. So decreased preload because of capillary leak and, and vasodilatation. The vasodilatation also causes low blood pressure. Some patients may be in cold shock with vasoconstriction and an element of myocardial dysfunction. So fluids are optimized. The next agent depends on the blood pressure, uh, on diastolic BP and pulse pressure. We already discussed that we probably go to NORAD or dopamine in the short term. So we, we don't know if there's a cardiac element or not. So we so these were the steps. We obtained IV access, given 40 ml per kg fluid. After fluids, um, BP and blood pressure still very normal for age. And this is a white pulse pressure shock. Um, 90 minus 30 is a white pulse pressure. So we need to determine whether a cardiogenic element is present. This patient has tolerated fluids very well. So until we know for sure, uh, we can try using uh, just noradrenaline for this patient. So the cause of shock could be warm septic shock with low blood pressure. So here, 
um, the patient has in has warm septic shock. His blood pressure is low, so we use NORAD after initial fluid. Right. The response to fluid and the response to NORAD will also give us a clue if there's underlying myocardial dysfunction. So after starting NORAD with a watch, very monitor the patient very uh, closely for worsening perfusion. If there's underlying myocardial dysfunction, the pulses, the heart rate will actually increase. Um, the heart rate will increase and pulses will go down when we use a vasopressor agent. This is a patient, the second case, four-year-old with viral myocarditis. He's tachycardic, gallop, um, tachypneic, wheezy, uh, cold extremities, but for his age, his blood pressure is not normal. So what can we do? What is the good agent for this patient? Yeah, okay. So, sorry, what happened? So between, so his blood pressure is normal. So the steps are obtain access, give cautious fluid deficit. Can we give diuretics? Um, his, um, the fluid was commenced and stopped as respiratory distress worsened. So this blood pressure is normal for age. <coughs> the pulse pressure is normal or white. The pulse pressure is narrow. Determined cause of shock is definitely a cardiogenic shock. He's got evidence of pulmonary edema. So it is a cardiogenic shock with low blood pressure. Is inotrope therapy indicated in which agent? Maybe because the blood pressure is no the blood pressure is normal, so you have much more to play with. Um this yeah. So looking at this table, if you're looking at cardiogenic shock with Normal blood pressure. So your agents would be initially the butamine. And, uh, if if the patient remains in low cardiac output and the blood pressure is maintained, we could start some megalone. Uh, since the blood pressure is normal, there's no rush to start a more powerful agent like adrenaline. You could diuress, but I would like to have some dobutamine on board before diuressing. Um, because we don't know what the circulating volume state is. So, yeah, that is actually my last slide. Any questions now? Tachycardia is there. Can we start with milgrenone? Uh, tachycardia was there, but what is the cause of tachycardia? The cause of tachycardia, which we saw in the initial slides, I'll just go back to. Yeah. Because so in um in cardiogenic shock, right? There's the contractility is decreased, so the stroke volume is decreased. The tachycardia is a compensation for decreased stroke volume, right? So maybe not is a good choice, and maybe he will tolerate it. But as I said, in the acute stages, you would always start with an agent with a short half-life. Sometimes when you use dobutamine, the, the stroke volume will actually improve. Therefore, the tachycardia, which is a compensation for lower stroke volume, may decrease. But so the, um, the, as the stroke volume improves, the blood pressure will improve, cardiac output will improve, and the heart high heart rate, the tachycardia may come down. But certainly, you would start any agent. So there is no hard and fast rule. Generally, we prefer agents with short half-life. So generally, dobutamine is a good agent. If you're worried, if the patient doesn't get better, you can start milrinone. Uh, if the tachycardia remains a concern, certainly you would come down on dobutamine and add in some milrinone. Um, adrenaline, because the blood pressure is stable, uh, it's not a, it may not be necessary in this uh, particular patient. You could diuress them as well, but 
So in the first instance, try and stabilize, find out what is happening. We don't know what the status of its intravascular volume is. So it is already a bit hypovolemic, um, although the blood pressure may be maintained by all the stress response. Um, we wouldn't want to decompensate them. So generally, there is no real hard and fast rule that milidone is wrong in the first instance. It's a, it's a, you have to use which agent you're comfortable with, but um, um, agents with shorter half-lives may be preferred. Any other questions? What is the ideal CVP? to ensure that we have adequate preloads? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, um, we, we, do, we do go by, I mean, CVP, unfortunately, um, circulating volume is just one factor that determines the CVP value. What are the other, um, other conditions that determine CVP? So if a patient is on, on positive pressure ventilation, that can raise CVP, right heart function very good. So if your right heart is failing, the CVP may be high. Even if he's hypovolemic, it's on positive pressure ventilation. Um, even left heart function and decrease with high LA pressures may transmit to CVP. So um, unfortunately, there's no one uh, one value for just CVP to tell us about circulating volume, and you need to play it by year. So you're generally going to test the patient, and in the first instance, unless it's an outpatient, uh, I don't know, we would not use um, a diuretic in the first instance. Stabilize the patient, um, check how his last urine output was. Every, I mean, there's so many, we just, Observe the patient for a while, use one agent after the other, and then you'll get a feel of what his circulating volume is. If you're not very sure and the patient has cardiogenic shock, sometimes even patients with cardiogenic shock do need volume, and, and agents such as milrinone can cause hypotension. So you can give a little bit of volume. It's not a complete no-no. You can try the effects of a small fluid bolus in two to five ml per kg and see if his cardiac output and stroke volume improve with fluid, and then uh, start your agent. So um, it is, uh, in, in such a situation, you need all the information you can. You check with an echo, uh, not just the IVC status, but how well it is collapsing with respiration. So uh, you need to have a lot of information. But, but a general, the rule would be not to use agents with a long half-life. Try to treat, uh, try to address low cardiac output and tachycardia using an a agent with a short half-life, such as dobutamine, especially when the BP is normal, and see the response of tachycardia and the blood pressure and cardiac output. If the patient stabilizes on dobutamine, then you can try a bit of diuretics. If the patient's cardiac output remains low on dobutamine, again, look at your blood pressure. Blood pressure stable, starts on milrinone. Blood pressure low, you start, give a little bit of fluid and um, um, give a, maybe uh, two or three ml per kg fluid, consider uh, adrenaline. Look at the ca cardiac function on echo. Make sure there's no tamponade, anything going on, so you need a lot more information. Right. Any other questions? Maximum adrenaline dose. Good question. So when you have a patient, we usually start with 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. When you have patients who are already on 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 of NORAD adrenaline, then it's a bit worrying because now you are you will be causing more of, uh, you'll be dealing with some toxic effects of medication as well. So you would use all these agents with very great care. 
So there, I mean, according to your books and literature, the maximum doses are even one mic per kg. People use two mics per kg. So in a desperate situation, uh, many of these agents have toxicity limited. So you go up, look at what uh, if the heart cardiac output is improving or not, and also look at tachycardia, your ST segment, uh, arrhythmias, uh, your lactates, renal function, etc. So if your toxicity is not too bad, then the doses are toxicity limited. That's a sensible way to um, deal with the patient. Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? I think most of you interacted with well. Any other questions? So, can we wind up now? Any more questions? I hope you're a little more clearer than when we started. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.